Hey everyone, if you don't know me, my name is One Mokhatle. I get the privilege of serving as one of the pastors at Rooted Fellowship. Now we are kicking off a brand new series. We're taking a break from the book of Mark. We wrapped up season two and now we're jumping into a new series. And I believe that God is calling us to this series because he wants to unpack some things, not just through his scriptures, but through us as well as a community. We're titling this series, Zoom In. Now, here's why. If you're like me, when we read the scriptures, we like to read quite quickly. We'll move from chapter to chapter, book to book, looking for our go-to favorite verses. But every now and then, I believe God calls us to slow down. Uh, As much as we love all of God's scripture, we should slow down in certain parts so that we might zoom in and understand with a little bit more depth what it is God is calling us to where he talks about himself and how we are meant to relate to him. And so over these next couple of weeks, we're going to be zooming in. And we're going to be in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 4. To be specific, Luke chapter 4, verses 18 to 19. They're they're going to serve almost as our launching verses as we go to different places. Again, Seeking to understand what it is that God is calling us to in this particular season and as we look forward. If I was to title this message, I would simply call it, Those who are called are also sent. Those who are called by God are also sent by God. But it'll make a lot more sense as we jump in. Now, Jesus is returning to his hometown. If we read, uh, maybe just before our text, we will see that he's become somewhat of a celebrity. You know, his teachings are becoming popular. He's becoming well known. He's performing some miracles. And and so uh, people know of him. But now he returns home. And so if you have a Bible, meet me in Luke chapter 4. From verses 14, but like I said, we'll be in 18 and 19, uh, but meet me in Luke chapter 4, verse 16. Jesus returns to his hometown, and he's a celebrity. He's a big deal. Uh, In fact, if anybody were to ask, can anything good come out of Nazareth? In fact, Nathaniel asked this in John chapter 1, verse 46. The locals could reply, yes. Yes, uh, here, here is something good. Here is Jesus. He grew up here and now all of Galilee is praising him for his teaching and his mighty works. Verse 16, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. As usual, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Now, now, because of this, our hometown boy is now a big deal situation. Uh, We can assume that the building was packed. The building was packed. Now let me set the scene to to what a general gathering at a synagogue would have looked like. They would have come in and they would have begun by singing, particularly from the Psalms, Psalm 145 to 150. This was then followed by the Shema, which goes a little like this, Shema Israel Adonai Elohenu Adonai Echad, which means Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. This uh, goes on to lay out the great commandment that Jesus would give us. But here, in this particular context, it would have been read from its original place, which is found in Deuteronomy 6 and Numbers 15. After the Shema, the 18 benedictions would be recited out loud. Then came the reading of the scripture. You see, an officer went to the holy ark, took out the Torah scroll, removed its cloth covering, opened it to the designated place, placed it on the table where it was read from by various attenders. The Torah was then returned to the ark, and a portion uh, from the prophets known as the Haftarah was then read. This was then followed by a sermon. The service was then closed with a series of benedictions, what is referred to as the priestly blessings. And after every section that would have been read, 
the people would have responded with a loud amen. A little bit like this. The Lord bless you and keep you. The people would say, Amen. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The people would respond, Amen. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. The service would then end and then the people would go home. Now, it is very possible that before the service began, Jesus would have been asked by one of the synagogue leaders to uh, read from the Haftarah, and then Jesus uh, would have requested, in fact, we're told here that he requested the scroll of Isaiah. Verse 17, so Jesus stood up to read it. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me. Because he has anointed me, anointed, anointed, anointed. This word anointed means to be set apart, to be consecrated for an office or service, to be chosen. And all of this comes with blessing, protection, and empowerment. Because he has anointed me, Jesus reads, to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me. Now, I want you to remember that. I want you to underline it if you're old school like me or or maybe circle it if you have an iPad. I just want you to remember this phrase. He has sent me. We're going to come back to that. To proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The reading, this one, was a combination of a couple of lines from Isaiah 58 verse 6 and then a good portion from Isaiah 61 verses 1 and 2. But but, but here, Jesus does something significant, very intentional. He leaves out a particular line. He leaves out a line from Isaiah 62 verse 2 which says, And the day of our God's vengeance. You see, by skipping this last line, Jesus got their attention. Uh, Many of those who were in attendance would have known this piece of Scripture. They would have been very familiar with the Old Testament. That's all they had back then. The New Testament had not been written yet. And so they would have been very familiar with this text and would have realized that Jesus did not read that line. It's safe to say that the room went silent. Super awkward. Everyone is looking at each other, wondering what is going on. Why would Jesus not read that line? But what happens next is what I like to say, next level. It's it's just something that Jesus and only Jesus could do in a setting like this. Read with me verse 20. He then rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. I want you to think about that for a moment. It's super quiet. Everyone is silent. It's actually awkward. Jesus recognizes this, but just simply rolls up the scroll, hands it back, and sits down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him. Noticing this, he goes, okay, I can see everyone's now looking at me. Uh, Let me explain what's going on. Verse 21, he began by saying to them, today, as you listen, this scripture has been fulfilled. Now, there are two massive things happening here, and I don't want us to miss them. Two big things happening here with Jesus responding this way. Number one is he's saying that the comfort and restoration of Israel promised long before by Isaiah has now found its ultimate expression in Jesus and in the message that he is about to bring. He's saying to them that that everything that you have been waiting for, everything that you have been hoping in, this message of hope that someone is coming to restore our our context and, and, and restore us, this message that would have been passed on from generation to generation to generation, Jesus saying it has now found its ultimate expression in me. The second big thing that Jesus is saying that I don't want us to miss is that while the day of vengeance was to come. You see, Jesus is not erasing that line out of the Bible. He, he's simply saying, hey, it's not, it's not today. It is still coming, hashtag the second coming. But the day of vengeance was not to be fulfilled today. Rather, what was being fulfilled 
was the, the day uh, the, the, of the year, of the season, of the time of the Lord's favor. Now, wh- why? Why is it favorable? Well, it's because the Messiah is here. The Messiah is here. Jesus is here. The ministry of Jesus was now underway. Now, I want us to slow things down. I want us to zoom in on what it is that Jesus actually read from the book of Isaiah. I want us to focus on this for a little bit. You see, Jesus here uh, unpacks four classes of people who would benefit from his ministry. He, he's laying out his plan to us. He's saying, hey guys, here's why I have come. And it's for these people that I have come. He, he, he lays out the four classes of people who would benefit from his ministry. We see the poor, the captives, the blind, and the oppressed. Let's double click these. The first one, the poor. Jesus was anointed to preach good news to the poor. Now the word poor can cover poverty of every kind, which to be honest would probably excuse many of you who are tuning in to this message. Now I know we're going through a lot, right? economic recessions and COVID-19 and, and I don't know where we're rated now uh, in this particular moment economically from a global perspective. So, so I know that many of you are struggling, but, but be careful, be careful to include yourself in the class of those who are experiencing poverty. And so upon reading this, many of you might go, well, that doesn't speak of me. I'm not poor. But before you check out, I want you to know that the emphasis here is on spiritual poverty. That's what Jesus is addressing. He's addressing spiritual poverty. That while materially you may have everything that you need, if you are separated from Jesus, then internally you are decaying. Likewise, captives has a spiritual application because the word technically means prisoners of war. Now, it's safe to assume uh, that as Jesus was reading this text, that there were no prisoners attached to the congregation. But the word broadly includes many forms of spiritual bondage. Bondage to money, bondage to guilt, bondage to sex, bondage to hatred, bondage to success, bondage to food, bondage to unforgiveness, bondage to religion. Bondage to approval. The list goes on and on and on. Jesus wants us to see beyond the physical and recognize our spiritual need for him. And so to all in the prison house of sin, the truth about Jesus' ministry allows us to sing, my chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. And like a flood, his mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing grace. Friends, this is why we sing these words. Because those who have crossed the line of faith, those who look to Jesus as Lord and Savior, recognize that before him, before he entered into your life, you were a prisoner to something hoping that that thing would give you life and meaning. But it come out empty every single time. The next group that Christ's ministry benefits, we're told, is the blind. He came to bring recovery of sight to the blind. In fact, Jesus used this phrase again when explaining to Paul, Paul the apostle, when explaining to him what his ministry would look like. In Acts uh, chapter 26, He says, I am sending you. There it is again. I am sending you. This is Jesus to Paul. Sending you to them to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light. From the power of Satan to God. That they may receive forgiveness of sins and share among those who are sanctified by faith in me. He came for those who are spiritually blind. But then lastly... He came to set free the oppressed. 
the core idea of oppressed here is, is broken in pieces, shattered, crushed. Jesus uh, comes to those squashed by life's circumstances who can see no way out, who maybe find the, the very uh, reality and idea of living itself an oppression. Jesus says, I have come to give them freedom. And so Jesus has come for the poor. He has come to release the captives, to give sight to the blind, and to liberate those who are oppressed. Now, I want us to notice that Jesus didn't just say these things. He did them. Jesus practiced what he preached if we were to continue to, to page on as we read the book of Luke, if we were to continue to read the other Gospels, we would see that Jesus not only says these things, but chapter after chapter, verse after verse, he is doing these things. Why? Well, because he is the Savior of the world, sent by God the Father, anointed by the Holy Spirit. And, watch this, and... He not only says these things and does these things, but he also wants us to see him do these things. He wants us to see how our lives are meant to be lived out here on earth. Which then makes the statement true that those who are called are also sent. That if you are called by God, if he has saved you, if he has reached into the depravity of your life to pull you out of darkness into light, then he has also sent you to go and do like Jesus has done. Now, I believe Luke chapter 4 verses 18 to 19 give us what many would refer to as our mission. This is the church's mission. In the same way that Jesus came with good news to the poor, to release uh, the captives, to give recovery of sight to the blind and liberation to the oppressed, then, then we are to do likewise. That is our mission as the church. But even in saying that, I've seen how the church has misused this portion of Scripture, uh, has misunderstood it, which has led to the misapplication of it. Uh, let, me, let me give you two. Two ways in which we, even as a church, as Rooted Fellowship, that, 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 that we could not, not fully understand what it is that Jesus is saying here that leads to the misapplication of it. Number one is by us limiting poverty, brokenness, oppression, and injustice to only physical and social realities. Let me read that to you again. It's by us as a church limiting poverty, brokenness, oppression, and injustice to only physical and social realities realities. We, we should not fall into this trap. In fact, Jesus uh, in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 17, says this to the church of Laodicea. He says, you say I am rich, I, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not knowing that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. He's saying, I can, I can see that you, you have everything. I mean, the church of Laodicea had it all. An amazing building. The finances were great. Everyone was giving. The ministries were just incredible. They had it all. And yet failed to recognize that what they needed more than anything that they possessed physically was a relationship with Jesus, a deep, authentic relationship with him. And so there's a word of warning here to the arrogant, to the self-satisfying, to those who pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. They don't need anyone. They don't recognize that they are completely poverty-stricken and that in the eyes of God, they are miserable. And friends, we should see them like that as well, that they are in desperate need of a Savior. So the first mistake that, that the church makes oftentimes when reading this text is limiting poverty, brokenness, oppression, and injustice to physical and social realities. The, the, the other mistake that they make is making no effort to relieve physical and social poverty, brokenness, oppression, and injustice. 
is for us to, to simply stand back and say, we just preach the gospel and that's it. Because we, we, we have our ticket to heaven. It's in our back pocket. We're good to go. So we just preach and then we chill. We don't get involved. But Jesus wants us to have compassion. He wants us to, to take action on behalf of those who are materially poverty stricken, those who are hungry, those who have been captured unjustly behind visible iron bars, those who are physically afflicted with all sorts of diseases like blindness, and those who are oppressed by heartless human systems that perpetuate evil. Jesus wants us to be involved. And we don't have to go too far to see it. Just page through the book of Luke and you see it. He, he is going and, and preaching about the kingdom of God and calling people to repent and believe. And he also engages in brokenness, the broken reality of people's lives. And so we as a church, we should feel compassion for the rich who are bringing eternal misery on themselves through slavery to comfort. And we should feel compassion for the poor who are crushed by present circumstances in addition to their eternal plight. Friends, what I'm saying to you is that the gospel is both and. The gospel is both and. We, we cannot separate the two. We can't pick and choose which one we want. That if you are impacted by the gospel, you are compelled to do as Jesus did. And so just as Jesus was sent, so he sends us to go do likewise. Now, now you might be listening to this or, or watching this and going, oh, nah, I don't know. I don't know about that. I, I don't know if, if, if that's true. You're making me uncomfortable. Give me some scripture on it. I'm glad to do so. John 17. From verses 13 to 19, this is a well-known portion of Scripture. This is Jesus praying to God the Father. He's praying for his disciples, those who are uh, present. But he's also praying for us, those who, who would come to the saving uh, knowledge of his grace. He's praying for us. And he, here's what he says. From verse 13, John 17. I, now I'm coming to you. I told them many things while I was with them in this world, so they would be filled with my joy. I have given them your word, and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world. Did you hear that? I'm, let me read it to you again. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world. Now, you might go, what? Yes. That as, as we look at all the brokenness that we're experiencing, as we, as we look on this year, COVID-19, and all that has come because of it, Jesus prays that he, God the Father will not take us out of this world. In fact, if we look throughout history, every time situations got rough, if you look at the different cities spread all across the world, every time those cities just became chaotic because of their brokenness and people were leaving, the church would move in. Because the church understood that we've been sent. That we have the message of hope. This message that reconciles people back to their father and then reconciles us to one another. A message of restoration. A message of renewal. And so Jesus says, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. Make them Holy, holy, holy. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. And then hear this, verse 18. Just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. J Jesus says, just as you, Father, have sent me, I am now sending them. And so it is clear in Scripture that those who are called are sent. And so we have to ask the question, what does that then look like for us as the church? This is why we are jumping into this series. This is why we're going to zoom in and try to unpack what that looks like for us as a church. To be sent just as Jesus was sent. Now we have a couple of weeks to unpack all of this, but, but let, me, let me close off by maybe answering this question, by just kind of setting the tone of what this series is going to be like. And I'm going to do that by answering this question. If 
we're saying, yes, we have been sent, then maybe the next question should be, how are we sent? How are we sent? As we make our way through the scriptures, I believe that we will see that we are sent with authority and expectation. We are sent with authority and expectation. Authority, the Great Commission, where Jesus tells his disciples to go and make disciples of all nations. It's an incredible piece of scripture. But, but, but I want us to read what he says just before that. If we, if we read verse 18, Matthew 28, he says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. All authority. The, the Greek word for all is all. All authority in heaven and on earth. To, to be honest, it doesn't matter what he says after that. Why? Because all authority has been given to Jesus and he now commissions us. He sends us out and so we go with authority. But we also go with expectation. We go with expectation. Mark chapter 9. We see Jesus moving from place to place. And as he sees people who are separated from God because of their sin, the text tells us he looks upon them as if they are sheep without a shepherd. That, that he's filled with compassion. The, the word there, splach nizome. He's filled with compassion. This all leads him to say, verse 37 of Mark chapter 9. Looking to his disciples, he says, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send there it is again to send out laborers into his harvest the harvest is plentiful but the laborers are few so, so the issue is not the harvest there is so much out there the problem is the laborers it's us you and i the 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 church now let me give an illustration here as I talk about authority and expectation, because I, I want us to, to hold on to these two words, to be constantly reminded of that as we make our way through this series. When I think about authority and expectation, I think about the relationship I had with my father. See, as a young boy, my father would often send me to go and retrieve things. He, he would uh, work on something with his tools and recognize that uh, I don't have, he doesn't have a particular spanner. So he would say to me, uh, hey, would you uh, get on your bike and go down the road quickly uh, to one of his friend's uh, houses and ask uh, for a spanner? And so I would get on my bike and make my way. You see, I would go with my father's authority. And so if I was asked, well... Why are you here? On whose authority are you requesting this spanner? I would say on my father's authority. Not my own. See, my authority means absolutely nothing. It's my father's authority that has sent me, and it's with my father's authority that I am requiring that which he has asked me to retrieve. My father would also send me with expectation. The expectation that I would return with that spanner, that I would do that which he had asked me to do. Authority and expectation. Now, every now and then, I would fail on the mission that my father had given me. It didn't happen often. Right? If you knew a little bit about my father, it wouldn't happen often. But every now and then, it would. And as I thought about the numerous reasons on why I would fail, the, the mission that he had sent me to do, to go on to get the spanner, I thought of three. Uh, the first one is opposition. I would sometimes run into some opposition. I'm on my bike. I'm making my way down to uh, where I have been sent to retrieve the spanner. And maybe on that particular day, uh, one of the houses where there's a crazy dog. I mean, I know many of you know exactly what I'm talking about. There's always that one crazy dog in the neighborhood, right? So uh, this particular house, for some strange reason, on that day, the gate was left open. And I can see it growling at me. And in that moment, I have to make a life decision. I have to make a quick decision. What do I do? And nine out of 10, I would make a quick U-turn and go back and say, look, I wanted to go. I wanted to complete the mission, but there was this opposition. There was the dog. So opposition. Opposition is a real thing. It can keep us from completing the mission that we've been given. The other reason 
is unclear instructions. Sometimes my dad would give me unclear instructions. He would say to me, go get the spanner. I would make my way there. I would request the spanner. I'm here on my father's authority to get a spanner. And then they would say to me, well, which one do you want? And it was at that point I realized that, wow, spanners come in different shapes and sizes. And I'd go, well, the instructions weren't clear. I don't know. And so I'd rather take all the spanners that he had or I'd just go back and say, hey, I, sorry, I, I need to know which spanner you're looking for. So unclear instructions, second reason that we don't complete the mission. The last one is just flat out disobedience. Flat out disobedience. He said, I'd get on my bike, make my way to where I was meant to go. And I'd run into my friends who were also on their bikes. We were a crew. We were known for riding our bikes through the streets. And so I'd run into them and we'd start up a conversation. That conversation would lead to, hey, why don't we just go buy some ICs? Uh, remember those? I don't know if you grew up with them, those little packets, and they'd put the uh, juice in there, and then they'd put it in the freezer, and you'd buy it. It was super cheap. It was great. So we'd make our way there, buy a couple of ICs, hang out on the corner. I'll just forget, forget that my father had sent me. Just flat out disobedience. Now, now I would call it distraction, but my father, in my father's eyes, it's just flat out disobedience. Now, now why do I tell you this? Well, we're on a mission. We've been sent with authority and expectation. God the Father, through Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, has sent us. And so, what are the reasons that we don't complete the mission? Well, number one, opposition. And opposition is a real thing. It's a real thing. But, in the same way that God the Father sent Jesus, Jesus sent the Holy Spirit and he is with us. And we're going to see that in the, in the next coming weeks. But, but he is with us to guide us, to, to watch over us, to protect us. And so, yes, opposition is there and it's real. Friends, it is real. The evil one lays out his strategy. His desire is to steal, kill, and destroy. But for those who have crossed the line of faith, for those who look to Jesus as Lord and Savior, we have the Holy Spirit with us. And so we are protected. Number two, unclear instructions. Well, God is not unclear. He is abundantly clear. And, and over these next couple of weeks, we're going to unpack the various texts. We're going to zoom in and we're going we're gonna to see that God is very clear on what the mission is. Very clear. So it's not that. Which leaves me to the last one. Flat out disobedience. Why do we as the church, as individuals who make up the church, wh wh why, why do we not complete the mission? Flat out disobedience. And while we may call it distraction, in our Father's eyes it's disobedience. Because I know. You might go, well, oh, no, you, don't, you don't know. You don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what I'm experiencing. There's so much happening in my life. I mean, COVID-19. But to think that the mission of God pauses because of COVID-19, would be for us to not understand who God is and what he has called us to do. We cannot be disobedient to the Great Commission. We must press in. We must go deeper. And so friends, as we celebrate Rooted Fellowship's fifth year as a church plant, as, as we thank God for his faithfulness in the past years, and, and as we look forward, trusting in him to continue to be faithful, my hope is that in all of it, we would not be disobedient. That we would trust him. That we would keep our eyes on the author and perfecter of our faith. And so as we unpack this series, as we zoom in, I'm hoping that God will take us deeper and further than we've ever been. And that we would see him do something more powerful than we could ever imagine. Because he loves us. He calls us to himself. And as he does that, he sends us out so others might know of this great love. And so as we zoom in, let's trust him. As we go out on the mission to make disciples who go on to make more disciples. Let's pray. And so Father God, thank you so much that you are abundantly clear, that you have given us your word. What a privilege it is for us to be able to open it up, to live in a context where we can do so freely, where we can preach it and teach it. And so Lord, I pray that we would not waste this time that we're in. I think of so many brothers and sisters all across the world who find themselves in places where they have to do this in secret, where there is much persecution. Father, I pray that we 
would strive to be obedient. Obedient to you. Loving you. Loving others. And hoping, praying, seeking to see others be transformed by the power of the gospel. Help us, Lord Jesus. We need you. In your name we pray. Amen.